asking God to help me so that I make it crystal clear, that's quite a bold prayer. <laughs> yes, he can. Yes, he can. But uh, uh, crystal clear, when we talk about revelation, the very nature of revelation is, is um, John being in vision. He's being um, not like some people think, like a trance-like state. He, he has all his faculties, but, um, but the quality of his consciousness is supernaturally affected. And he's seeing things uh, in heaven. He's seeing things from a, a direct wiring from an angel of God. And um, so uh, I don't hope even to make it quite crystal clear. Let's just see if we can attain some understanding that will bring us closer to God through our study together. So tonight we're going to study um, when God said to eat a book. Now you know what I mean about crystal clear? It's, we're starting already. God told us to eat a book, and then the last part of it is the two witnesses. And so it's a, it's a fascinating study, and let's get right to it. Uh, to um, give some background to our study, let's review quickly. Revelation 1 introduces the author and addresses the church. Revelation 2 and 3 addresses the churches through time. It's forecasting the condition of the churches. Revelation 4 reveals that worship is the central theme of the book of Revelation. And as we're going to see very soon, worship is the central theme of actually the great controversy. The resolution between good and evil on this planet has to do with worship. Worship is just another way of saying our conscious willing to be in a relationship with our Creator. That's what worship is. When we consciously reach out to him, we are worshiping. Whether it's in prayer or song, corporate worship like in church, it's, um, it's the central theme of Revelation. Revelation 5 shows us that it's all about the victory of Jesus. Because Jesus had a victory, we can have that victory. But because Jesus suffered, and that's the lesson tonight, God's people who are following Jesus. There'll also be some suffering. Revelation 6 is the opening of the six seals. Revelation 7 is the sealing of the faithful. Revelation 8 shows the seventh seal and the first, uh, I meant to say, I meant to type the seven seals and the first of the four trumpets. And Revelation 9 shows the, the fifth trumpet, which is the first tear and the sixth trumpet, which is the second tear. Now I'm going to turn this screen off and ask you to repeat all that. It's, it's really kind of a complex organization, isn't it? But it can be charted. It does make some sense. So um, uh, the sixth trumpet is a, a second tear. And tonight we're going to do Revelation 10 and 11. And we're going to find in just a moment that Revelation 10 and 11 is a little bit of an interlude right before Jesus comes. Um, the next seal is Jesus coming. So there's this little bit of an interlude. And what makes it a little bit more complex is it brings us right up to Jesus coming. It talks about Jesus coming. And then Revelation backs up a little bit again and it goes from a still yet another angle and it talks again several times about right before Jesus comes zeroing in on the issues of worship right before Jesus comes and what God is hoping for in his people right before he comes again so are you ready here we go Revelation 8.13, Then I looked and I heard a single eagle crying loudly as a flew to the air, Tear, tear to all who belong to the world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. You know what? I must be out of my mind. I'm actually starting to do this without any of my notes. Can, uh, can you imagine? And... Uh, I usually have these in my Bible. So I'm going to, you'll forgive me if I just uh, 
use them directly instead of having them in, in my Bible. But, um, but this particular um, text is important because it shows us that uh, the exact timing, this, we're, we backed up several chapters now, and we're seeing exactly um, where we are in terms of the last three angels blowing their trumpets. So we're right before the last three trumpets. And um, the first woe is the next trumpet. The fifth trumpet brings the first tear. When the fifth angel blew his trumpet, I saw a star that had fallen, fallen to earth from the sky. So the fifth trumpet is the first tear. The sixth trumpet brings a second tear. When the sixth angel blew his trumpet, then the four angels who had been prepared were turned loose to kill one-third of all the people on the earth. I'm just reviewing now to show uh, where we are. So now the, um, the sixth trumpet has brought the second tear. And now the second tear is passed. But look, the third tear is coming quickly. The seventh trumpet brings the third tear. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. So what is the, the, the last trumpet? It's the coming of Jesus. So now we're in this interlude period. This means that Revelation 10.1 through 10.14, and that's what we're studying tonight, as regarding the eating of the book with its sweet and bitter experiences, is dealing with the same events as the sixth trumpet, but now from a different perspective. Remember, we, we just read that the sixth trumpet already blew, but the seventh has not yet blown. This also means that uh, the time of the sealing, which started in Revelation 7-4, the gathering for the Battle of Armageddon, which we spoke about in Revelation 16, it was ahead of us a little bit, and it, the same period of time is just before the close of probation, or meaning the last chance for people to repent and to worship God. So this is all different uh, things that are happening in this interlude period right before Jesus comes again. Uh, in other words, this interlude is a continuation of the sixth trumpet, but it's from a different perspective. Do you remember the Revelation 9's view of the sixth trumpet showed how the uh, what the fate of the wicked was during this time. Now, during the same period of time, we're going to look in Revelation 10 and 11 what happens to the faithful during this period. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, surrounded by a cloud, with a rainbow over his head. His feet shone like the sun and his his, feet were, his face shone like the sun, and his feet were like pillars of fire. And in his hand was a small scroll, scroll that had been opened. He stood with his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a great shout like the roar of a lion. And when he had shouted, the seven thunders answered. When the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying, keep secret what the seven thunders said. And do not write it down. Then the angel I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his hand towards heaven. He swore an oath in the name of the one who lives forever and ever. <laughs> oh, I tried so hard to time this right. <laughs> and the sea and everything in it. And he said there will be no more delay. When the seventh angel blows his trumpet, God's mysterious plan will be fulfilled. It will happen just as he announced it to his servants, the prophet. What was the seventh trumpet again? When Jesus actually comes. Then the voice from heaven spoke to me again. Go and take the open scroll from the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. Catch up to where we were here. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the small scroll. Yes, take it and eat it, he said. It will be sweet as honey in your mouth, but it will turn sour in your stomach. So I took the small scroll from the hand of the angel and I ate it. It was sweet in my mouth, 
but when I swallowed it, it turned very sour in my stomach. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, lang nations, languages, and kings. Now, uh, we're going to go through this. Um, I read the whole uh, piece. Now we're going to go through it and see if we can understand it a little deeper. Uh, first of all, the scroll sealed uh, in Daniel that we read about. Um, you'll remember that that same scroll in the hand of the Lamb being unsealed in Revelation 5. So uh, remember we talked about the sealing of the scroll in Daniel. That Daniel wrote many prophecies, but they weren't to be understood until the end times. Then Jesus in Revelation 5 took that seal and he opened it. And now it's in the hand of the angel of Revelation 10. So I went to the angel and told him to give me this small scroll. Yes, take it and eat, he said. It will be sweet as honey in your mouth, but it will turn sour in your stomach. So I took the small scroll from the hand of the angel and I ate it. It was sweet in my mouth, and when I swallowed it, it turned sour in my stomach. What do you think the, um, what this means? It was sweet at first, but did it remain sweet? No, it didn't. It, uh, it was uh, sweet at first to, uh, to understand it, and to prophesy it, but there was a response to sharing it. There was a response to sharing the end time gospel message. It's sweet to experience it, but when you share it, there's some persecution that comes, and it's no longer such a sweet experience. When the seventh thunder spoke, now we're backing up. When the seventh thunder spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, keep secret what the seven thunder said, and do not write it down. What do you think that means? It means that he heard something God was telling him, but he wasn't allowed to share it. What did the seven thunder say? We don't really know, because it is still sealed. It is something that has not been revealed to us yet. Then the angel I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand towards heaven. He swore an oath in the name of the one who lives forever and ever and created the heavens and the earth and everything in it and the sea and everything in it. And he said there will be no more delay when the seventh angel blows its trumpet. God's mysterious plan will be fulfilled. It will happen just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. How many times did he announce this? How many times in how many books of the Bible does it point to this end time? Very often, lots. From the uh, earliest chapters, we studied uh, this morning a little bit, in the book of Revelation even. Do you remember what Jesus did in response to the first occasion of sin? He slain, he slew an animal, and he covered Adam and Eve with it so they wouldn't be naked and ashamed. So they were able to, to stand in his presence being covered in this way. And symbolically, that, of course, meant that he was promising them that he himself, the perfect lamb, the lamb without blemish, would be slain. And his death would cover them in his righteousness. The righteousness that he earned, they would be able to wear. So that covenant was made at the very beginning, foretelling his coming again. And then often it spoke about how uh, we remember back in uh, Revelation 5, how God's people over the centuries were symbolically gathered under the altar, crying out, how long, how long until we will be uh, revenged, until justice will be done. And it's something that many people have a hard time handling, but there will be justice. God is perfect love, but he's not a wishy-washy um, person who says, well, I just love you so much. You know, we'll just let sin and death and pain and misery go on forever and ever. I'm never going to draw anything to a conclusion. We're just going to let everything go the way it is now forever. 
He's promised he will come. There will be justice. There will be a perfect resolution to this conflict between good and evil. Then the voice from heaven spoke to me again, Go and take the open scroll from the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the small scroll. Yes, take it and, and eat it. It will be sweet as honey in your mouth, but it turns sour in your stomach. So I took the small scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it, and it was sweet in my mouth. But when I swallowed it, it turned sour in my stomach. I forgot the quote, but this is a quote from um, a repetition of this. Then I was told you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, language, and kings. So what is the point right before Jesus comes again with the message that he is wanting to share? It's going everywhere. Just as Jesus Christ uh, came and it was at first just for the Jews, then it opened up to the Gentiles, and now again this, this last appeal of the gospel message goes to the whole earth. It's not local in any way. It's for, for everyone now. Now, uh, Ezekiel 2.8 has this same uh, vision. Son of man, listen to what I say to you. Don't join them in the rebellion. Open your uh, mouth and eat what I give you. So you see this symbolic language of eating the scroll is the same thing that's coming from Ezekiel 2.8. And uh, the good news is that although it is sweet to eat, it is sweet to experience, again, when you share it, what happens? You, you get some persecution. Personally, one-on-one, -on -one, how many of you have actually tried to share the good news with someone? It often is, you have, praise God, it's a very hard. When they are receptive, it's a beautiful, beautiful experience because you have the sense of heaven rejoicing in this communication. And then when they're rejecting it, they often feel like um, they're rejecting you a bit too. It hurts. Sometimes people are quite uh, violent about um, uh, rejecting the gospel message. I remember um, when I first uh, became a Christian, I I had been in a Christian church before. I'd actually been in a Benedictine monastery for two months studying for the priesthood. So I was very much in a church before. But yet, after I left it, and 17 years later, when I actually accepted Christ in, in a meaningful way and realized that um, it wasn't just a matter of, of me needing him and wanting to be holy, which I had experienced when I was younger. But when I realized that Christ had done it all already for me, and he was just offering it to me as a gift, when I realized that, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I went and shared it with all my friends. And I shared it with this one lady who uh, was uh, my wife and I, perhaps our best friend. And when I shared it with her, she became emotionally violent with me and as if to show me that she had been there done that she began reciting scriptures I have never heard scriptures before or after recited in an evil tone she was sharing these scriptures with me but her tone was see I know all that stuff you're going on the wrong path um, the Maharaji that I am following he is a perfect master in the flesh, and I've been there, and I've done that. And in effect, as she was reciting scriptures, her tone or her voice was really as if she was saying, blah, 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 blah. It was just a, um, um, a, a painful, painful uh, experience. It was the first time I shared, and it was uh, the first time I had been uh, abused like that. So, Revelation 14, 6, 12. The three angels, I saw another angel flying through the sky, 
carrying, <laughs> excuse me, carrying the eternal good news to proclaim to people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Where did you hear that language? <clears throat> Just a moment ago, in this interlude period in Revelation 10, I'm jumping ahead to show you that the Bible from now on will jump back and forth right before Jesus comes again to Jesus coming again. And finally, it does it at the end of Revelation one final time with Jesus coming again. And then it explains exactly what happens. The, um, the taking his people with him to heaven for a thousand years, his return and what happens then, and the establishment of the new earth. It's, it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. But now we're in this interlude period again. I'm jumping ahead to Revelation 14 to show you that this message is being repeated, that it goes everywhere. There's an outpouring of the Spirit. We know from other texts that this outpouring is accomplished by means of what? The huge outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is promised us that comes in what's called the latter rain. Who's heard that term before, the latter rain? You have? It's beautiful. It's, um, it's taking its imagery from the growing season in Israel, just like all the, um, uh, all the feast days and so forth. It all comes from the harvest. We're going to preach on that soon. I had a request to explain that more. But very, very briefly, um, Israel um, is, uh, has, is in a certain climate, and the harvests come at a certain time. And the harvests coincide with an early rain, which is uh, sufficient for uh, planting and so forth. And then the latter rain, which is what uh, yields the final growth before the crop is harvested. And uh, we need both. And the latter rain is compared in prophecy to what will happen to make this good news able to be proclaimed throughout the whole world. Some see it as something that's already happening. Some see it as, uh, no, uh, there will be uh, even more of an experience that's happening now that will be much more like um, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, while it be accomplished, accompanied by a great outpouring of signs and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, it's a wonderful thing, but we'll continue this. I'm going to go through Revelation 14 twice tonight. So I'll go through it kind of quickly. I'll dissect it a little bit more later because it is so, so important. This Revelation, Revelation 14, that's what my life, my ministry is all about, is Revelation 14. Hopefully, if I'm doing a good job, every time I preach, I should be able to tell you how it fits in to this. Because this is what we are to be doing in this time of history. And so hopefully everything I do relates to this. And then in verse 7, at the very bottom of your screen, it continues, Fear God, he shouted, and give glory to him. For the time has come when he will sit as judge. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all the springs of water. Then another angel followed him through the sky, shouting, Babylon has fallen. That great city has fallen because she made all the nations drink, uh, all the nations of the world drink the wine of her passionate immorality. Now we're, we're going to explore this a little bit more deeply, but just at the moment, you see that there's still this, this conflict going on between what here is called Babylon in uh, previous chapters of Revelation. It, uh, it described them as in a number of things, the 200 million, uh, the beast, those who follow the beast. There's a number of symbols for those who are against God's work. But here, what's interesting to me, um, the language now is Babylon, but the focus is that she used uh, that the, the method is force. She, in another text, in another um, version, it uses the word force. Here it says she made, she forced the nations to drink. So what this says to me is that the system is coming that will use force 
to take people away from pleasing God and worshiping Him the way that He should be worshipped. Because remember, Revelation is all about worship. And so that's a concept we're going to return to a number of times. Then a third angel followed them, shouting, Anyone who worships a beast and his statue or accepts his mark on the forehead or on the hand must drink the wine of God's anger. It has been poured full strength. That's the seven seal. It's talking about the coming of, of uh, Jesus again into God's cup of wrath, and they will be tormented with the fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the angels. The smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever, and they will have no relief day or night. I'm going to pause just for a moment here. The smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. What language is that coming from? What Old Testament event? Do you remember Sodom and Gomorrah? That's exactly right. It had that same poetic structure. What was going to happen to the when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed? The smoke from the fires of their destruction. First of all, how were they going to be destroyed? By fire that rained down from heaven. And the smoke from their destruction would rise from the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah forever and ever. I've been on the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I can testify that there is no more smoke rising from it. So what does that mean? It means it's symbolic imagery that those cities would be destroyed and they would remain destroyed forever. That's the point of it, which is interesting from an archaeological point of view. Because from an archaeological point of view, almost all ancient cities had been rebuilt again and again and again. Do you know why? Because there's reasons why people normally settle in a certain place. There's an abundance of water or natural resources, or for one reason or another, it's just a, a, a good place to live. So something happens, people leave, uh, or it's destroyed, they don't even leave and they begin rebuilding immediately. In most cities, it's, it's kind of hard for me to imagine. <clears throat> you have to think of a broad expanse of time. But most cities have these different layers of civilization in it. And it is so amazing. Archaeologists use a, uh, I forgot the term uh, that they use for it, but it's the science of uh, comparing styles of pottery. Because potteries... Uh, pottery is one of the things that just seems to last. Uh, often it, it's fired in a kiln, so it's very dense. And it doesn't fall apart like even bricks do. So um, they compare different styles of pottery, and they could actually, they, they'll often they'll, they'll cut a sheer line straight down, and you can actually see the different layers of uh, the people who live there. And uh, everyone has trash, and people... Uh, if you uh, look at some of the garage, I don't have a garage right now, but if you uh, looked at some of the garages that I've had, uh, you'll know people tend to want to, when they throw things away or e even into a storage, they want to um, put them as, uh, they don't want to have to walk very far, right? So in our garage, what we do is I would clean it up and we start putting things in it and just generally kind of, you know, chuck it on the floor and pretty soon it's coming closer and closer to the door. <laughs> and they were kind of putting things just a little a little bit in there. And my workshop is kind of the same way until you, you know, just it's not workable anymore. And you got to start over. Well, because of this tendency that is in humanity, it's not just me. It's in humanity. Um, people threw their garbage out, always quite nearby these cities. Not a very sanitary thing to do. And what broken broken pieces of what would be in their garbage? Their pottery. So it's a tremendous tool uh, for archaeologists to see these layers of trash that has pottery in it. And by comparing the styles of how the pottery is made, they know they can date it quite well. So um, uh, some of these ancient cities, we know how often they were rebuilt. 
and you could uh, dig down and then you could see streets from uh, several, you know, from a civilization past. Um, 10, 15 feet down, you could find the street. It's amazing. But in Sodom and Gomorrah, when God destroyed it and said the smoke from the fires of their destruction will rise forever and ever, that's what he meant. It will be destroyed and remain destroyed. And the same language is used here. The reason why I clarify it um, so painstakingly is many people see, see, the, um, the dead will be punished forever and ever. And in that, in one sense, yes, the result of their punishment is what? The wages of sin is death. Their punishment is the second death. <clears throat> that punishment lasts forever. They will remain dead forever. But they're not kept alive somewhere by some mean, cruel God, kept alive forever so that they continue literally um, burning forever. There's a, another text that says the cries of their torment will rise forever and ever. And it has the same uh, meaning. So uh, so let's go on here. And they will have no relief day or night, for they have worshipped the beast and the statue and accepted the mark of his name. As I said, we're going to go over that a little deeper later, so we'll move on uh, right now. This means that God's holy people must endure persecution patiently, obeying his commands and maintaining their faith in Jesus. I forgot there was one more verse. So again, this compares very, very closely to Revelation 10 when it's talking about um, the uh, persecution that goes with sharing the gospel. Now back to Revelation 10, verse 11, which is where we left off. Then I was told you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages and kings. Do you get the connection? Revelation 14 is an expansion of some of the issues brought up here in Revelation 10. And we're going to re-experience that a number of times, so get used to it. There's some repetition in the books of Revelation. Now, on to the two witnesses. The second part of our presentation is in Revelation 11. This chapter has three parts. Um, 1 to 2 describes the measuring of the temple. Revelation 11, uh, verses 3 to 6, the identity of the two witnesses, and that's what we're going to focus on a little bit more, and then the death and resurrection of the witnesses in uh, Revelation 11, 7 through 13. Um, Revelation 12.17 talks of the dragon being enraged with the women. Then he goes to make war with the rest of her offspring. I'm, I'm backing up here just a little bit so we could, or, or going forward a little bit so we could get an idea of where we're going. Uh, Revelation 13 talks of the beast's power, the setting up the image of the beast, and the enforcing of his mark. And Revelation 16 talks of spirits of devils working miracles, gathering the kings of earth, for the battle of Armageddon. So all this, all these chapters, are going back to this time of the sixth seal. Even though it talks about the seventh seal, and it brings us right up to it, then it backs up again and goes again and again and again, saying, what about this period of time? This is an incredibly crucial period of time. This closing chapter in history there's a lot that's going to be happening. Revelation 17, 14 describes a war between the Lamb and his followers and the powers on the earth. And Revelation 19 describes Christ leading the armies of the heaven to fight against the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Revelation 11, let's begin. Then I was given a measuring stick and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the number of worshipers, but do not measure the outer courtyard for it has been turned over to the nations. They will trample the holy city for 42 months. Now, we're going to be talking about the time, but first of all, this outer courtyard. Who remembers the sanctuary structure? What goes on in the outer courtyard? Uh, the outer courtyard <coughs> is 
um, if you see the uh, well, first of all, the the uh, tall section right there, you can't hardly see it. I could, it on the dark section, my laser pointer will work. Uh, that's an entrance into what? The most holy place, the holy of holies, that uh, only the high priest could enter uh, once a year to clean and to remove the sins symbolically on the Day of Atonement. Place him on the scapegoat, who then would be led out away from the people of God, where their sins would be led away from his people, reenacting the final Day of Atonement when Jesus... Now, Jesus already atoned for our sins in his death, but has all the sins been removed already? No. Jesus paid the penalty for them and the sacrifice for Jesus' um, uh, that Jesus did toward the atonement was done outside of this Holy of Holies and it was enacted how many times in the Jewish uh, system of uh, temple worship? Who remembers that? Every day, all the time sacrifices were going on all the time and uh, they represented uh, the death of Jesus covering the sins that people commit daily and the blood then from the animal was brought into the uh, most holy place so we will explore this a little bit more deeply but the thing to remember is that even though you know this the killing of animals and all that it sounds so barbaric it sounds so um, archaic and uh, unloving, especially with the modern sensibilities towards the treatment of animals and so forth. It sounds kind of cruel and whatnot. But you have to remember, God instituted this setup not to um, not that the blood of uh, innocent animals was going to accomplish anything literally, but just as a as a way to get the people to remember that their sins bring death. But that death could be paid for by another, the perfect Passover lamb. That's why even in their system, why else do you think that the lamb that was chosen uh, to be slaughtered, it had to be perfect. It had to be without blemish. Because anything that had a blemish wasn't perfect. And in symbolically speaking, only a perfect man can die for our sins. Because if he sinned even a little, then he would, oh, he would have forfeited his life, just like we have all forfeited ours. And then he couldn't help us. Any death that he experienced would have been on his own, for his own sins. But since he didn't sin, his sin can cover us. Are you glad for that? I am. So the uh, sanctuary service, um, now the, the church can be described as the temple of God. The human body can be described as the temple of God. But the temple of God also is talked about as existing in heaven. Uh, it's often talked about existing in heaven. When um, Moses made the first uh, tabernacles out of tents. How did he make that? God showed him a vision of the heavenly sanctuary and said, and make it this way now while you're traveling. He, they made a, a compact, portable representation of the temple. Then when they settled in Jerusalem, um, God showed uh, David a vision of of how the temple would be. But interestingly enough, he didn't allow David to build it. Do you remember? He allowed David to accrue the resources to build it, and then Solomon actually built it. That's why it's called Solomon's Temple. The first uh, temple was destroyed and rebuilt and enlarged. So um, uh, the heavenly sanctuary is where Jesus is ministering on our behalf as the high priest now. He's our what high priest? Heavenly high priest, Hebrews tells us, the New Testament book of Hebrews. So, so all that's happening here in this service is 
there's elements of it happening now, the most holy place being where Jesus is now in heaven. It's a fascinating study, and it's nothing that can be uh, exhausted because of what it represents. If it represented something small and earthly, then you could study it and you're kind of done with it. But you cannot ever really exhaust a study of the sanctuary because it represents the plan of salvation. It's, it's, uh, it's so deep. So um, this is a picture of uh, the golden altar before the veil in the holy place uh, that was mentioned was also mentioned earlier in Revelation 8, verses 3 to 6. And you see that there's an incense burning on it that is mingling with the prayers of God's people and symbolically rising to the Father. Mm -hmm. Now, the outer court that we mentioned a while ago, in this scene, you can see it a little better. Now, I actually uh, stood here and saw this. This is a... Uh, full-scale replica of uh, Jerusalem in Jesus' day. This was then the temple that was built by uh, Herod. It was uh, called one of the wonders of the ancient world. Uh, even uh, Rome uh, marveled at it, which was one of the reasons why they actually had it destroyed, is they figured it was too uh, beautiful and too magnificent and it filled the people with a rebellious pride and so they the Romans destroyed it but the outer temple which is what I'm uh, getting at here and my uh, laser printer um, laser pointer won't point at it you could see pretty easily where it is that's where who could go yep anyone the Gentiles uh-huh it's anyone the Gentiles could go to this outer temple only. Then, uh, yes, then there was a uh, inner, then there was a little inner more place where even the women were allowed, if you could imagine that. And then there was a place where only the men were supposed to go. Then there was a place where only the priests served. Then there was a place where only the high priest can go. So um, the word here... Um, uh, Gentiles can also be translated as nations, which is kind of an interesting thing when you look at the language that we just used. Now this is a uh, surviving um, uh, tablet that uh, warned those who uh, uh, were not supposed to go into it, into the temple. And I have it written down here somewhere. It... Um, <clears throat> Oh, I don't have it written down. But you got the idea. It's, uh, it's saying, you know, uh, Gentiles, you don't go beyond this. They were not allowed into the inner uh, temple. Um, they were divided uh, by the separation. And even though it sounds somewhat unpleasant to our modern senses, uh, the idea was what? Now, a Gentile who became a Jew he wasn't a Gentile anymore. They could go into the inner place. In other words, the separation that occurred, although to us sounds like segregation, and it brings us to mind the American segregation experience of if you were of this race, then you could go there, and if you're of this race, you could go there. And so the our modern sensibility is one of, of abhorrence for things like apartheid and other abusive uh, separations of dividing people. But in God's words, there is a dividing that is fair. There's a dividing that you could like it or you could dislike it. That really doesn't make any difference. It's, uh, uh, you've heard the story of the lighthouse and the battleship. And uh, there, were, there was... Well, I kind of gave it away here by saying who they were, but there was this communication going back and forth between the flashing lights as a, a two, uh, two uh, military uh, Navy personnel were communicating with another. And what turned out to be the lighthouse, and I'm giving it away, of course, is uh, was flashing, uh, turn to your left, 
you know, imminent danger. And uh, a battleship commander, you know, was affronted by that because he was, after all, you know, a commander and he was a battleship. And he, uh, to cut the story short, he said, you know, this is the U.S. something battleship. You know, you turn to your right. And then the guy answered back, well, you know, this is, you know, Cape something lighthouse, you know. Uh, so you could have whatever opinions you want to, and you could argue any way you want to. But the bottom line is that there is a separation that existed then in God's plan of salvation made into a model of the temple that is going to be acted out in our times. A separation between people who follow God and people who don't follow God. People of a mark of the beast and people of the seal of God. The question is for us is which one we're going to be with. Not whether or not it's fair or it's pleasant to our sensibilities. <coughs> Excuse me. Now this uh, period of time that was mentioned, it was mentioned uh, uh, 42 months. We're not going to dwell on this too much, but um, uh, just, and I don't mean to make you dizzy, but these are all different ways the Bible talks about the same period of time. Every one of these cases is talking about the same amount of time. We've gone through that study before uh, several times, especially with our 10-day seminar. Do you remember that? So uh, we're not going to spend too much time. I'll refer to it in a moment one more time. And uh, I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will be clothed in burlap and will prophesy during those 1,260 days. During that period of time, which ended when? In fairly recent history. That's why we know that it's the end times. Is this period of time has uh, expired. And who are these two witnesses during this time? Uh, it's kind of a neat uh, picture of them, isn't it? Uh, there are several different interpretations of them, and I hate to uh, be too dogmatic about which one is the, the accurate one. Um, historically, um, members of uh, the educational institutions that I went through had one interpretation, but as scholarship advances, they're beginning to see that it has different interpretations. Um, the two witnesses, these two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that before that stand before the Lord of all the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire flashes from their mouth and consumes their enemies. This is how anyone who tries to harm them must die. They have power to shut the sky so that no rain will fall for as long as they prophesy. And they have the power to turn the rivers and oceans into blood. And they will strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. Now, some say that these uh, two witnesses are Elijah and Moses. Some say, and I have believed for many years, that they were um, the Old and New Testament the two witnesses that were um, uh, oppressed all during this 1260-year period. Then at the end of this 1260-year period, the oppression of the scriptures uh, had ended and God's truth began to be made available to the people. There's a number of different ways to interpret them. When they complete their testimony, the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit will declare war against them and he will conquer them and kill them and their bodies will lie on the main streets of Jerusalem. And what I believe this, uh, this fits in very well with the interpretation that the two witnesses were the Old and New Testaments. The scriptures that testify, Jesus said, of who? Of him. The scriptures have no power of eternal life. They only point to him who does have the ability to offer eternal life. So um, at a certain point in this 1260 year period, it was actually uh, punishable by death to translate or to have versions of the Bible that the church did not approve. Um, now at a time when I was in the church, it was in the 1968. 
who remembers what happened? Uh, it was in the church, the Catholic Church was in the middle of something at that time. It was the Second Vatican Council. And it changed many, many things. But up until that time, did you know that um, every church service in uh, the world that the Catholic Church held uh, was in Latin. It was in Latin. And so um, it was just my luck. I studied Latin for four years. I studied an ancient dead language for four years. And the day that I graduate, then Vatican II Council says, we're not going to use Latin anymore. But that's okay. I, I left that church uh, the same year anyway. But um, uh, the point is that they used Latin and even the scriptures were read in Latin. Now the gospel, they were already, they had already allowed to be read in the language of the people. But the rest of it was all in Latin, which created this, this monopoly, this uh, intelligentsia of uh, the priesthood where they were able to maintain power for centuries by denying people access to the scriptures that would allow people to understand God's plan of salvation independent of the priesthood. So it kept them dependent and subjugated to the thinking and the will of the Catholic Church. Now, the Catholic Church, as much as I uh, loved it, um, had changed things. You already studied this back um, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, um, starting actually even after the first century after Christ died, a slow change came into place, which by the third century was officialized into changing the day of worship even. Instead of worshiping on the Sabbath day that scripture tells us to, that Jesus worshiped on, the disciples worshiped on, they changed it to uh, a different day, the day of the sun as a political move to create unity within the empire. And <clears throat> the uh, interesting thing was is they, they used force to maintain their monopoly on scriptures. Conveniently enough, so all the differences between the things that they were doing and the scriptures would be unknown to the people. For example, scriptures plainly say, call no one father except your father who is in heaven. So what is the Catholic priesthood called? Father. It's like, I don't mean to sound like I'm against anyone or anything, but there's just some things that the Catholic Church did that I did that were against what scripture says to do. Um, the gospel is free. Right? Freely given? Well, they actually, to raise money, one pope got the idea, conveniently enough, right around the time that the printing press was made, of printing out certificates of indulgence. You know the story, don't you? So that uh, the Catholic Church was able to hand you something saying, here, here's a hundred years off of the punishment, because in the Catholic system they had this kind of middle world kind of thing where when you died you have to be purified because they didn't believe that Jesus' death was enough to purify you. You had to do some suffering before you were allowed in heaven. So uh, rather than suffer for longer, you could buy, it's called an indulgence. This is what started the Reformation. And you could get out of this purgatory a little sooner. Sounds like a good, sounds like a bargain to me. 10, 20 bucks for 100 years off of burning and misery? Yeah, hey, I'll take five. <laughs> so, you know, it worked really well. They raised an enormous amount of money that way. And uh, Martin Luther, that's one of the things that, uh, since he was able to uh, read the scriptures himself, he was able to see, hey, you know, this is crazy. This isn't the gospel anymore. Salvation is uh, from Jesus Christ and faith in Jesus Christ alone. So, um, so uh, those faithful witnesses, if they were the Old and the New Testament, or another interpretation is God's people who believe the gospel message, 
they were persecuted all during this time, often to death. The city that is figuratively called Sodom in Egypt, the city where their Lord was crucified, and for three and a half days all people, tribes, languages, and nations will stare at their bodies. No one will be allowed to bury them. <clears throat> all the people who belong to this world will gloat over them and give presents to each other to celebrate the death of the two prophets who had tormented them. Because you see, um, when you're living out of harmony with God's will and the truth is spoken to you, it feels like torture. Do you know how you know this? Think of the last time you're in an argument with your spouse and you kind of knew your spouse was right. But you were caught up in a moment of pride and you couldn't quite let it go. Have you had that experience? Substitute spouse for friend, anyone at all, who <clears throat> knew you were wrong about something and were trying to tell you something that was true, but you just didn't have the humble spirit at the moment and you couldn't bring yourself to, as Paul says, die, die daily. You couldn't you know, let it go. Well, it's torture, and uh, uh, I get it. When they complete their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit will declare war against them, and he will conquer them and kill them, and the bodies will lie in the streets of Jerusalem. This is a repeating theme from the oppression that even the demon oppression that will go against God's people, even to their death. Now, uh, note here, uh, I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will be clothed in burlap, and will prophesy during those 1,260 days. And uh, this is in 11.3, and this is in uh, verse 7, when they complete their testimony. So you see how this is relating to that time same time frame. This is the best way I could try to diagram it to you that the two verses are in perfect harmony. Um, now when Jesus had finished his testimony, he was put to death. But he rose again and ascended to heaven. And that's exactly what's going to happen to God's people who are martyred in his name or suffer persecution in his name, they will also experience the, uh, a rebirth in Christ. We suffer with Christ, and we are risen with Christ. The city that's figuratively tall, called Sodom and Egypt, the city where the Lord was crucified for three and a half days, all people, tribe, language, and nations will stare at their body, and no one will be allowed to bury them. Now, Sodom was known for its immorality, and Egypt was known for Pharaoh's self-sufficiency. Remember the boldness in which he declared, who is this God that I should listen to you? And then uh, Jerusalem was where Jesus was crucified. The price paid for witnessing all the people who belong to this world will gloat over them. And we'll give presents to each other to celebrate the death of the two prophets who had tormented them. So it's natural when you witness to receive some of this. Christ received it. Why would we think that we would not? And yet, we're all so timid about it. We don't like, who of you would prefer to be liked rather than disliked? Of course, we prefer to be liked rather than disliked. It's very, very hard to tell people truth when they don't want to hear it. Now, does that mean that you should tell people truth who don't want to hear it? There's scriptures that balance out when you should witness and when you shouldn't. We'll explore them another time. It's a, I knew this individual who... Uh, <clears throat> 
was very abrasive and um, cold and hurtful in the way he witnessed. And people would, you know, uh, be negative to him. And he goes, <laughs> you see, I'm being persecuted. And he couldn't get it. And, and I was trying to explain to him, no, you're being obnoxious. You're being rude and obnoxious and hurtful to people. And that's why they're responding to you that way. But he couldn't get it. To his mind, if you speak truth, it's like truth is truth. Truth brings persecution. It's like God gave us a mind to understand these things. And they're not all so, uh, so easy to do. But after three and a half days, God breathed life into them. And they stood up, terror struck all who were staring at them. Then a loud voice called from heaven, called to the two prophets, Come here! And they rose to heaven in a cloud as their enemies watched. When does this happen? In the fulfillment of the seventh seal. At the same time, there was a terrible earthquake that destroyed a tenth of the city. Seven thousand people died in that earthquake and everyone else was terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second terror has passed, but look, the third terror is coming quickly. Actually, I made a mistake just a few slides back and lest anyone uh, uh, it sinks into your subconscious, I um, uh, forgive me, This it's a little hard to back up on this system, but um, but here, and I said, when does uh, this happen? Uh, this this happens still during this period of time before Jesus comes again, not as he comes, but before he comes again, just to be clear. The second terror is past, but look, the third terror is coming quickly. That's what alerted me to my mistake when I read the next, <laughs> the next verse. But after three and a half days, God breathed life into them and they stood up. Terror struck all who were staring at them. Then a loud voice from heaven called to the two prophets, Come up here. And they rose to heaven in a cloud as their enemies watched. Now, Revelation 14.6. Um, Time-wise, uh, uh, that clock is not working. Who has the time? 25 after 8. Just to be sure. <laughs> I, want, I wanted to make sure it was after 8. And I hadn't gotten carried away and talking all night to you at 20 after 9. Okay, so I have time to go through this again a little bit more uh, carefully than we did before. Uh, Revelation 14, 6. Um, the three angels. And I saw another angel flying through the sky, carrying the eternal good news to proclaim to the people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language and people. And it says they're cut up in heaven in a cloud. Um, this is the preaching of the everlasting gospel, the eternal good news. Some translations use everlasting because the good news was the same from Genesis to the end of Revelation. It's the good news that God had this plan before the foundations of the earth were even laid. God had this plan. It wasn't a sense of, I'll, I'll try having my people behave perfectly, and if they do, everything is good. That didn't work. We'll call that the old government. So now, hmm, what should I do? I know I'll have this new experience. I'll send Jesus down. It's the same God who created the world had this plan from the beginning. He didn't change his mind halfway through. It's the eternal, it's the everlasting good news. Now the call is made to fear God and give him glory. And uh, for the time has come when he will sit as judge, worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. God <clears throat> is thought of so much now as one of his essential characteristics, which is love. God is love. I love to preach on love. I love to be loved. I love to love. I love love. It's, it's beautiful and it's good. It's the richness of 
the human experience at its highest potential with the Spirit of God enervating our hearts so we can experience love. But God is more than just this force of love. God is one who created us. Because of this, he is way above us. His thoughts, the Bible says, is as high above our thoughts as the heavens are above the earth. It's because he's a creator and we are created beings. There is this gulf between us. There will always be this gulf between us. Love does not mean there's no gulf. When we worship in, in heaven, we'll still be created beings and he'll still be the creator. We'll live face to face, we'll experience his love directly, but we still will be created beings and he will be the creator. So we're to worship him in this way that elevates him to his proper place. He's not, uh, we, we, the scripture, there's one scripture that says, <clears throat> that uh, we're not given a spirit of bondage again to fear, but a spirit of sonship and daughtership, wherein our spirits cry out to God, and his spirit testifies that we are the children of God. We're his children. And as children, the scripture, the scripture continues, we cry out, Abba, Papa, Daddy. We have this intimacy, and yet... We're still created beings. There's an intimacy, but an acknowledgement that he is God. He's the creator. He will never be the creator. So there is an element of worship, which we will get deeper into again soon. What does this mean to worship God as creator, as opposed to just worshiping him as the God of love and the God of mercy and the God who saved us. We worship him also as a God who created us. And at the same time, there was a terrible earthquake that destroyed a tenth of the city. We go back to this now. As a result of this proclamation and the upheavals of the world, an earthquake that sees a tenth of the city collapse and 7,000 killed. The word for terrified here, let's see, yep. The word for terrified here in 1113 has the same root as fear God in chapter 14. So there's this connection that there is a holy fear that is being called upon from the people now in, and that these um, things, these horrible things that happen have a purpose. The second tear is past, but look, the third tear is coming quickly. God's kingdom is proclaimed. The seventh trumpet brings the third tear. When the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices shouting in heaven, the world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. He will reign with us as kings and priests. He will still be the creator God and we will never be, but we will be kings and priests. That's good enough for me. Is it good enough for you? I'm willing to worship a God as the creator who has such noble hopes for me as his adopted child. I'm willing to worship him in any way that he asks. Now the, the rest of the world at this time, the rest of the institutions of the world will all fall into ruins, but not us. God has a plan for us. In the, the, the courtyard where the uh, people who worship God only only knowing him, but not accepting him. The demons knew Jesus was Jesus, do you remember? But they wouldn't follow him. They wouldn't bow down to him. But they knew who he was. In the end, we will be vindicated 
those who stand up for Christ, those who are bold and willing to experience some pain as a result of following him, will be vindicated. And when we see him coming again, we, while the rest of the world is in ruins, we will be lifted up and we will be made kings and priests. Are you willing to endure some hardship in order to experience a wonderful victory like that? Are you? Are you willing to experience some hardship, to experience the wonderful plans that God has for us? It's my hope. It's my hope that we are. The more we know him, the more we regard these little pains and trials of this world as really nothing of consequence. It's all will pass, but God's kingdom will last forever, and I want to be a part of it. Let's bow our heads and pray that that might be so. Heavenly Father, we all want to be a part of your kingdom. Make us strong. Fill us with your love. Help us to know that we don't need to worry about what other people think of us. Help us to give our testimonies wisely and lovingly in places where it would be helpful. But let us not be so over careful with the real issue being we're afraid of people um, persecuting us or disliking us if we tell them the truth about what we think of you. Help us to be bold and willing to have some persecution. It will only last for a time, and your kingdom will last forever. Bring us home, dear Father, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.